if there's a civilization there, it explains why the military is guarding these zones as if it's Eden themselves. Sure. And people say, oh, why don't we just go up there? What about all the people who have been up there? Why don't you just take a U-boat, a boat, a plane? Why isn't it that simple, Brooks? Well, we could charter a plane and do it. We we raised the money to uh, rent a 727. We were going to fly directly over it. But the lowest that they would fly is 20,000 feet uh, because that's just their rules. They they don't do scud running. They're not going to fly below the clouds. The lowest they would fly was 20,000 feet, which we would see nothing. We'd mm. just take pictures of, of a grayed out sky. From the sea, there is no way to do it because it's covered in ice. You need an icebreaker to do it. Uh, there's no way to do it by dog sled. I, I can tell you right now, we're not talking about you know smooth snow like you know in 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 Colorado uh, in something in a big bowl. No, no, no. We're talking pieces of ice, hundreds of feet high, sticking up out of the ground and coming up out of the ground all the time. Yeah. You could you could fall into a fissure and you would never be found. No one would ever find you. Mm. It's it's treacherous. You could never do it by dog sled. The only way to do it is to navigate the thin areas with an icebreaker of the class of the Arctica, something that can break three meters of ice and travel at eight knots in ice. That's the kind of ship that you need. And what about U boats then? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I've known a couple of, I interviewed a couple, I interviewed a corpsman and I interviewed a rear admiral, both of whom had navigated uh, the Arctic in a submarine. So, yes, it could absolutely be done. Uh, you can't take any measurements from a sub because you're under the water, so there's no information that you can gain other than, you know, sonar information, but... The ocean up there is 4,400 meters deep, and a submarine can barely go 500 meters. Oh, right. So you, you're not going to get much of a picture. No. Uh, sonar, sonar doesn't work that way. You can do side-scan sonar. That is technology that's available, and we have done as deep as, as, uh, as 1,500 meters with side-scan, but it's very slow. I mean, because Antarctica's landmass is basically, you know, figured out by sonar, isn't it? Yes. Well, a Antarctica is a landmass. It's a continent covered in snow. And then some of that, you know, extends out onto the ocean. But the Arctic is not a landmass. It's, it's open ocean covered in like a glacier. It's a totally different structure for the Arctic. Yeah. Yeah. So you talk about icebreakers. Uh, are there still icebreakers that could do this? Yes. Uh, there were three of them at one time. Then the Yamal was retired. It was very old. Then the 50 Years of Glory was retired. Then the Captain Kalibnikov. It's still seaworthy. But they've just built a new ship called the Arctica. And it is a new nuclear-powered ship, 450 feet long, 75,000 horsepower. And uh, it is capable of making the trip, and it's brand new. It was just built last year. That's excellent news, because I heard that the last one was going to be uh, commissioned. So yeah, the, uh, the uh, Captain Kalibnikov, which is a 1968, I think, era ship, used to be one of the Soviet uh, icebreakers, it was purchased and now belongs to a company called the Murmansk Shipping Company. Uh, and they used these old icebreakers as exploratory ships. But when you run a reactor on a boat for that long, eventually the iron of the ship becomes radioactive. And so the ships have to be decommissioned. Mm -hmm. But the new ship is called the Arctica, spelt with a K. And it is, a, is quite the vessel. Hmm. And that's possible for private uh, hiring? So uh, you can actually rent that? Yep. You have to plan a couple of years in advance. It's about $3 million American uh, to rent it for 15 days, and that's what we plan to do. Okay. Tell us uh, about this. First of all, um, 
tell us uh, about the original uh, because you you kind of were dragged into this project, weren't you? I was, uh, as I told you, we we had written the Ark of Millions of Years, and the idea that Earth was hollow came up, and we researched it, and we kind of ran up against a dead end. There were not many, not much information at all in 2004 about that. None of these experiments had been done yet. So I thought, well, <clears throat> what I need to do is probably I need to go on a an expedition to the Arctic. So I I began to do research, and I found that there was. An, uh, an adventure coming up <laughs> in yeah. 2006. Yeah. So I said, well, I'll join. So I, I joined up. And at that time, it was being run by a man named Stephen Curry, who was had already done several expeditions to different places. He was a, a wild man, but he was he lived in Salt Lake City. And I met I talked to him on the phone, and we, we decided to pool our resources and I joined the expedition. I was going to work on the gyroscopes to measure the curvature of the earth to see if we could find this opening. And then in the summer of 2006, I spoke to him in November. And then in the summer, all of a sudden he dies of rapid onset brain cancer. Boom. Just gone right, like that. Right. And, so, and that was public that he was the head of this expedition, right? Sure. Oh yeah, Absolutely. And they had the funding at that point. Well, no. What they were doing was they were they were selling tickets for about twenty two thousand dollars a piece, and they had some people that had purchased tickets, and that's how they were going to raise the money to do it. And in those days, it was going to cost about one point eight million or one point nine million to rent the Yamal to do it. And uh, what it was shaping up. We were we were getting a, a roster of rich tourists, and um, anyway, he passed away suddenly. So they refunded all the money to the people who had put up their money, and then they, the board called me and said, "Look, you you do big projects all the time. You do these big plans for the the big companies. You're used to doing projects of this size. Why don't you take over as expedition leader?" Mm. And so I said, well, let me think about it. This is like August or September. So in October, I called them back and I said, I, I think I can do this. So let's see if we can do it. This is 2006. Let's plan for 2008, the summer of 2008. We'll do a pilot film. I invested some of my own money and we traveled around the world and to these different places. And we took film and took evidence and we produced a pilot film. We competed in 2007 in the Genes of Galileo contest in Tokyo, Japan, and we won. And we won some money and we won some notoriety. We had 11, 17,000 people watched our film that night. And our 17 million, I'm sorry, 17 million people saw our film that night. So I thought, okay, we're, we're off, we're running. Well, there was no such thing as crowdfunding or any of that in those days. Mm. But, you know, we... we uh, did 20 cities in 12 months trying to raise enough money and we we just fell way way short because the economy in 2008 was in the crapper <laughs> nobody was investing in anything everything was upside down yeah so uh, i did a couple of energy projects i built a biodiesel plant and started building electric cars and i'm still doing electric vehicles and so we kept trying every year after that, and then it just it just became. After I had nearly a hundred thousand dollars of my own money in it, I just decided that it was not feasible to do. So, you know, I've been, just been kind of gathering information ever since then, and now we've finally the economy is turning, yes. and we've got some companies that are interested in sponsoring us and we've got some researchers out of Australia that have contacted me and now it looks like we're beginning to get them up. Yeah, but you've been very tied to this sponsor paradigm and, and of course that works uh, but the problem with it is that you are in the mercy of the money bag, that's one thing uh, but the other is that you are also in the mercy of the economy as you say, if you do a full crowdsource or both then all it takes for the crowdsourcing model is to get the word out enough. And oh, yeah. To, to, raise, to raise three and a half million dollars by crowdsourcing? Oh, my gosh. You would, need, you would need at least 50 million email addresses, maybe <laughs> 70 million. <laughs> I don't know any 
has a database like that, and you can't no. use, you can't use Facebook or anything like that, even though there's billions of people on it. Yeah, no, that's you, controlled. You couldn't afford the reach. It it would cost you a hundred thousand dollars a month to do something like that. Yeah, but I'm I'm just thinking if, if you could get the word out enough, you know, so people could. Um, uh, because most people would chip in something if they thought something would come out of it. But if I, you know, if I thought we could get um, global television coverage for ten minutes, we probably could. Do it. Yeah. But uh, yeah. you know, we I've been on Discovery Channel, History Channel, National Geographic Channel, True TV, Science Channel. Uh, they yeah, but every time, have you said to them, hey, we're crowdsourcing, please support this project? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And we oh, did okay. Coast to Coast. We did 13 shows on Coast to Coast about Hollow Earth, and, and we tried to do crowdsourcing. And, you know, we'd raise a few thousand dollars in a in a show, but the, okay. not, nothing like you need to be able to do something like this. Mm. Okay. But I'm telling you, Brooks, you better have like 24 hours live to the internet kind of coverage when you, you finally get this off. <laughs> well, it's hard to do because there's no, uh, there's no way to upload to satellite uh, except, uh, you know, for two hours each day. So what we, what we were planning on doing was running cameras 24 hours a day. We figure in 15 days we can get about 3,000 hours of, of yeah. film. And then what we were going to do is upload that every time the satellite comes over, upload the packets, and then download it to a server in Europe and a server in the U.S. or in Canada, and then sell that space for, I don't know, $19. You could watch the whole expedition live, like a big reality program happening right before your eyes. And, uh, of course, we would get way, way more footage than what you could stream live. And so when we got back, we would do the post-production work and then put out a maybe a 13-piece series on Netflix or Hulu, Amazon. If you come back. <laughs> because if you find something there that's really worth showing, not just scientific oh, stuff, gosh. do you think they will allow you to air it? They couldn't stop it because it's if it's going to go live, that's the thing. Every two hours, we upload whatever we see. That's... That's how you get the buy-in. You say, look, we're not going to hold anything back. You know, you're, we're going to have 100 scientists from all over the world in the roughest waters on planet Earth for 15 yeah. days away from civilization. This is going to be a reality program that will make deadliest catch look like last man standing. <laughs> right. Yeah, and if you can muster this thing, it will be, I mean, wow, people will sit glued to that. Yes. And even if something should happen, let's say an accident or something, at least we will see what, you know, led up to that point. Although I don't think they can disappear you if you're going to be in a friggin' icebreaker. Hey. That's that's a hard thing to disappear. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And there's no ship that can that can be up there. I mean, maybe a submarine, but there's no ships that can go up there, and there's no fighter jets that can go that far out either. There's no. is no. You'd have to you'd have to have a long range plane to to intercept us out there. But we're talking about surveying ten thousand square miles in fifteen days. It's very very aggressive, and these seas have never been seen ever. It's like going to a different yeah. planet. And we might only see whales and ice. And you know what? I'm cool with that. But what if we do find something that's anomalous? Everyone will want to know. That's that's why we, we want to do it. I, I think if you I, I think the obstacle, the challenge is to get on that damn boat. It's to get the money and then get on the boat. As soon as you're there you will because there's a reason they are closing off all these are areas that have not been seen before it's not been touched by by humankind uh, for a long long time we might have had one or two people in the military like you say Tule greenland mm -hmm. you'd get you'd get quite a view but we're talking hundreds and hundreds of miles away from that all the way up to an 86 degrees north way over like 140 degrees east that's that's no man's land. No one's ever been there. Yeah, but do you know that you have the permission from the Russian authorities to go there? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. In fact, the Russian shipping company wants to joint venture it with us. They're excited about doing it. Wow. So, so Putin and company won't stop you like the Americans would? Not at all. They're 100% behind us. Yeah, but I, I think they must know. I mean, they have. Why don't they just take their own ship and go and, well, maybe they have. Maybe they have, but it's never been yeah. done that I know of. It's never been filmed. No. Okay. Well, when it gets anything close to that, you come back and we'll have a, an entire show about that. And, um, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But because here's an open door for that, and you'll get uh, 100,000 viewers just for that. Yeah. A couple of the neat things about this project. Uh, the first is the passion that I get from people about the hollow earth. People are yeah. really, really passionate about it. And the other thing is <clears throat> over the last 10 years, I have amassed probably more hollow earth information than anyone alive. And a lot of it is, is stuff no one else has seen. So it's really, it's enriched my life and I want to, I want to return the favor. Uh, when I produce a book or produce a film where we actually do this expedition, it I I plan on returning the favor. I'm going to give everything I have to the people who are interested in this subject because it's so enriching. Yeah. It really, you know, it it ties. It is something about it that goes straight into our core. It resonates with so many people, and you know, truth usually does that. Sure. I mean, there must be a reason that this has been in the ancient lore. And I'm going to have another chap on. I don't know if you know about him, Harry Hubbard, but he has maps. And he's going to cover more about the mythical parts and the ancient parts of the whole world thing. That's why I didn't press you too much on it today, because you can present the scientific part. But there is something about this that really entices uh, idealists, at least, if not those skeptics. It's I think so. Yeah. And if we approach it right and we bring the right scientists on the boat, people are going to say, wow, they have MIT there. They have Stanford. They have Cambridge. They have, you know, they can't deny all of that. Exactly. And, and as, as far as I understand it, you're also going to do traditional mainstream scientific tests, right? So it will pay anyway, scientifically. That's all we're going to be doing. Uh, we're, we might, you know, cover the more esoteric things in some of the camera lenses, but all we're going to be doing is mainstream experiments. Hang on. How can you even know when you get to the poles? Nobody of the, of the other people could know. How can we know? Well, it's not, it's not the pole, but it's the opening. And that's a very good question because we've brought that question up many times. How will we measure when we're actually crossing into you know like a low place in the sea the only way to measure that is going to be with a precision gyroscope like the same kind of gyroscope that's used to aim missiles so this is not going to be easy to do it's not going to be easy to get on the boat but we're going to be able to actually measure the curvature of the earth with this ship and that's going to be a very important measurement. I don't think it's ever been done before. Hmm. So not sextants this time. Not sextants. 